there and welcome to the Read All Over show presented by Lit Carnival and me, your host, Toy Thomas, author, blogger, and reading advocate. I am so excited about today's guest. Mike Allen is an author, editor, and publisher of genre-bending fiction and poetry. Let's meet Mike Allen. How are you? Doing okay. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to find out more about your work. I've seen some of the images that you've already shared with me and everything looks amazing. So <laughs> before we get into all of that, why don't you tell the viewers a little bit about yourself? Okay, so uh, uh, I'm Mike Allen and I am, um, so I'm a writer and an editor and a publisher. Uh, I have uh, with my wife, I Anita, I run a micro press called Mythic Delirium Books, which this year is celebrating its 25th anniversary of existence. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. And as, as I mentioned, I'm also uh, an author. Um, I, when I'm left to my own devices, I tend to write very dark fiction, stuff that is either horror or horror uh, adjacent and uh i know nobody can ever see you know book covers when you hold them up to one of these little cameras but uh so so these two books are kind of i i guess the 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 biggest releases with my name on it as as author so far in in my career unseeming and aftermath of an industrial accident and uh, they are collections of horror stories and dark stories. And, and both of them were finalists for the Shirley Jackson Award, which obviously I'm super proud of that. But it's also <laughs> another <kind> of, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It's also kind of amazing that that happened because that was two totally different sets of judges, two totally different years. So uh, I'm 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 very I'm very pleased that I can in some way attach the name Shirley Jackson <laughs> to my career. Uh, I have, uh, since you've given me permission to talk about myself, so <laughs> I, I I have one published novel so far. Uh, it's, it's called The Black Fire Concerto. That yeah. came out 10 years ago. So so it's it's been a while, but it's... Uh, uh, I, I, one of, one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite reviews of the book called it like brimming with magic and music and mayhem. Uh, it's, it's set in this sort of post post-apocalyptic future where magic works and where, uh, the world has essentially been overrun by zombies, although they're called ghouls okay. in the book. And they're and you know they they do they do spread by bite in the traditional way, but they're they're magical. It's not a virus. Okay. Uh, and in that in that setting, uh, it's meant to be kind of my version of a sword and sorcery setting. Although the the heroines, uh, Alyssa and or Urze and Urzel, that's kind of the that they're kind of like the master apprentice duo that's traditional to this to the sword and sorcery genre uh you know they're not uh they're not swords people uh you know Alyssa is Alyssa uses magic and she's also kind of a master sharpshooter uh she has this she has this uh magical instrument that can be played kind of like a flute but it, it can also be converted into a rifle and it's enchanted so that she never misses like her, none of her shots ever miss. <laughs> That's so much fun to write because she can do so many crazy things. And, uh, you know, Erzel, her very young apprentice is also, uh, a, you know, kind of a sorceress in, in training. And uh, they, uh, they're, they're, uh, uh, they're 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 on a quest actually to find Alyssa's missing sister, okay. who unfortunately turns out has you know some connection to be to to the source of the of of the of the evil that afflicts that world. But uh, I've 
so so I found out at StokerCon this year. So mm -hmm. you know, please forgive me for this tangent. Um <laughs> when when that novel came out, it wasn't terribly widely read. Mm -hmm. But I, I found out attending my first StokerCon this year that it it came a lot closer to being placed on the the final stoker ballot by the jury than than i had <laughs> than i had any idea had ever wow. happened you know wow. one of the one of one of the jury members of the year uh it came out came up to me and it was like hey i wanted you to know i really loved your novel <laughs> it was like nothing i'd ever read you know i you know, I don't. So, so that was very gratifying uh, for me to hear. And I guess the segue to that is, I have my second novel uh, is scheduled to come out next year through uh, Broken Eye Books, which is uh, a, a small press uh, based in based on the West Coast, uh, and it's called Trail of Shadows. And so, I'm I'm very excited for that. Unless I don't have any objects or art to show you. <laughs> Although I have been, uh, I have been in consultation with the publisher over the cover art, and a cover has been commissioned, and it's just really, really exciting. And you just have to take my word for it. <laughs> well, I, I mean, like I said, I've already seen some of the images that you, that we're I'm going to be, you know, sharing with the audience as we go through this interview, and whatever relationship you have with your publishers or artists, whatever. Your book covers look amazing, so I'm I'm I, I can just imagine what this next cover will be like. <laughs> Thank you. So so that was uh, I'm, as you'll notice, I tend to you know I'm I'm sort of a shy person, but you give me you give me even a little bit of license, and I will just kind of ramble and ramble and ramble. <laughs> I see that, so. but that but that's going to be great for what we have planned. So um, I do want to segue into our first segment because sure. I really want to really kind of get into all of this stuff and we may even come back to some of the things you've already um talked about but the first segment that I have is called um on the bookshelf and I call myself a reading advocate I feel like everyone should have a healthy reading lifestyle whatever that means for them and so especially people who write and publish I feel like if you're gonna do that then you should also be an an avid reader again, whatever. Absolutely. That you. So I love finding out about writers and you know creatives what their reading habits are like, and so got a couple of random readerly questions for you. Sure. So, um, is there a genre that you've tried, but it just hasn't worked out for you? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so my answer to that is that probably if you take my reading tastes as a whole i'm i'm fairly um, omnivorous mm -hmm. i mean i don't you know i don't really read romance uh but i don't i mean i i can't say i wouldn't enjoy a, a romance if i if i read it you know i way 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 back in uh way, way back in high school when I was assigned to read uh, Pride and Prejudice by, uh, you know, Jane Austen. I I actually loved it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I really, I really, really enjoyed that book. Um, so here's, I think I know how I can answer this, which is that when I was much younger, Oh, sorry, my my cat made a tiny cameo there. That's oh no, good. that's fine. You might hear my dog in a minute. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, uh, this is off off to off camera. Here is Pandora, uh, who who we call Dora for short. Oh, that's so uh, cute. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, when I was much younger, I was a huge. I guess I still am, but I I you know I was a huge fan of. You know, the Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien, um, C.S. Lewis, the Narnia series. And, uh, you know, and 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 there's a lot of other books I sort of got into from that starting point, uh, like, uh, you know, the the Earthsea trilogy by by Ursula Le Guin and the Chronicles of Prydain by Lloyd, you know, Al Alexander, um, you know, 
uh, all, all sorts of all sorts of epic fantasy stories. And these days, I find I just don't have any interest in reading e epic fantasy. You know, I, I was for I was for a while following, you know, keeping up with the wheel of time mm -hmm. by Robert Jordan. And I, I gave up about book seven i was like i just read a 700 page book where nothing happened yeah. <laughs> you know i just I, lo I lost i lost patience um and so someday i presume you know i'm gonna i'm gonna come around to to reading that type of of book again but right now i'm just not i, I just don't have an interest in it uh i think you know, I blame some of that on on Robert Jordan, but you know, <laughs> also I think just just my personal interest in a reader, you know, have 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 sort of moved away from that. Not that I'm not interested in in fantasy. Oh yeah, no, anymore. I think uh, yeah, I think, I'm, I think I can relate to that. I mean, I I don't think you ever completely like lose interest in a genre that you like, but like you said, sometimes you're reading interests or habits change a little bit over time. Sure, sure. Yeah, so so that would be I guess that would be my that would be my answer to that. I I can't can I think of an can I think of a a a type of writing I've tried where I've just bounced off of it totally. I don't I don't think I can. So that's that's um very refreshing. Um I don't I think I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this kind of question. Again, I'm all for sure. people finding, you know, what works for them as far as reading. But I, I do find that when I ask this question to like just if I'm at a, like a book fair or con or something and I get a lot of, you know, some people are very passionate about what they do and don't like reading, you know, some sure, sure, not reading that, you know, and that's fine because it's good to know what you don't like so that you can focus on the things that you do like. So I get that. Um, I do. I feel I'm a little bit like you where I'm very what was the word you use? Omnivorous. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Omnivorous. Okay. But um. I would say, yeah, there are certain ones that as of late, I haven't been reading as much, you know, so I can relate. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let me, I'm going to toss, because I had another, this is a little bit self-serving too, because as okay. with, as with Claire Cooney, this is, this is an author uh, who I have, who I know and have also published, uh, Nicole Corner Stace. Okay. Um, but so so this this kind of mingles me reading as just a reader and me and me reading as a, as a publisher. Uh, N Nicole has one of the most original series of books out that I I've, I've certainly ever encountered and and I hope I I hope people who come across her work will will try the full experience. So so her first novel now excuse me it was her second novel. Her her second novel, uh, Archivist Wasp, was was published by Small Beer Press, yes. and it is this it is this astonishingly original book, in which it's it starts out in this post apocalyptic society, and that's very that's super violent, and you have a a woman who is the character of the title Arc Wasp is her name Archivist Wasp uh and she is she is this teenager who has been who is forced to be the the priestess of this twisted cult and the way she keeps her position is you know the acolytes who are also teenage girls younger girls you know challenge her for the position and she has to kill them in single oh, wow. combat so there's there's a uh and and uh, one of her jobs is to capture ghosts. Ghosts exist in this world, and you know they 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 have the potential to provide knowledge of the times before. And she encounters a ghost who is much more powerful than any she's ever encountered. And he, but he is the ghost of like this cybernetic super soldier. From the from a past age of this world, and he is so he is powerful enough that like his gadgets work. So like 
so like suddenly this Wait, whole he's a so cybernetic like this, ghost yeah so like this whole different genre like injects itself into the story okay. and he is on a quest for he is on a quest for the his partner from when he was alive which was like hundreds possibly thousands of years ago and so archivist wasp and this ghost go into the underworld and but you know with with like these two different bringing these like sort of two different areas eras area eras of technology with them into <laughs> in into into the underworld and yeah so it's like it's a wildly original premise uh, very I, i've never heard of anything like that <laughs> and, and so uh the way things worked out so there's a sequel to archivist wasp okay. called latch key that continues the story and and i was the publisher of that oh. uh and you know even more there's even more of sort of like the 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 wild genre blending uh and then uh and then uh nicole came out with a novel called firebreak and this was actually published by um this this was actually published by simon in in schuster by by saga press okay. and uh if you this is a little bit of a spoiler, though. This book's been out a while, so I don't feel too guilty about this. If it's this, been more this, than a year, it's not a spoiler. <laughs> yeah, this this is this is a story about the the high tech ghost and his partner back when they were alive. Yeah. So it's so it's it's a, so the book is like a straightforward kind of cyberpunk sci science fiction story. Except that if you've read these other two books, you're like, wait a minute, like it, these are the same people who are like ghosts in this future. <laughs> so it's like a prequel, basically. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah, and but it wasn't advertised that way, so it was like kind of a stealth, gotcha. and and some you know kind kind of like a stealth prequel. And something that I think is astonishing is that, and if. You know, if you know the ins and outs of publishing, you know how incredibly difficult this was to do. Uh, with these three books, like, you know, with these three books, Nicole kept them, like, totally in sync. Yeah. So there are, like, there are, like, scenes in Archivist Wasp in Latchkey that also occur in Firebreak. Which, yeah. you know, which came out through this totally different publisher. Oh, <laughs> and, and it's, and... Uh, and you know, if you read through to the end of of Firebreak and how it ends, if it's a cool ending, but if you've read Archivist Wasp, you you you're like, oh, that's how that happened. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you know that that's I I want to I wanted to kind of plug that too as as you know something that, you know, again not something that's not popular. These these books have had readers, but. Uh, you know, it's I, I I love I love when people can do like really strange and wild stuff, and yeah. you know, I like to promote that when I can. That's cool. So yeah, I mean, I I love um I and I think I can also relate to it that sometimes it's not that a book is unpopular, it just doesn't have as wide of an audience as it should, and so. Right. Like you, whenever I come across something like that, I tell as many people I can about it just to increase that because I feel like if I enjoy it someone else will probably enjoy it too <laughs> yeah absolutely all right so that was on the bookshelf getting to know a little bit about you as a reader I thoroughly enjoyed that I really I love the how you talk about you know your reading experiences so I I I, I don't know if that was for the viewers but that was definitely for me <laughs> the next segment is the open book and so this is where we actually get to talk about your process as a writer and I might even ask you some publishing questions just because I know you're also, sure. a publisher, but I do want to start with the writing first um, because I am a writer myself. I'm a constant work in progress. Um, like you, I had my first novel out more than 10 years ago, but I've been working on a lot of short fiction and stuff. So I'm always cool. interested in getting to know about other writers' processes. Okay. 
So for you, um, you mentioned that, you know, you kind of write a lot of dark um, fiction, whether it's straight core or like a blend or whatever. I'm wondering when you start that process of a new story, what comes first? Is it the concept, the setting? Is it the character? Is it the actual plot? What typically comes first when you're starting a new story? So it kind of varies from story to story. Um, so so I, I guess my, my favorite writing process story uh, to talk about uh, has to do with the my story, The Button Bin, which was uh, a finalist for the, the Nebula Award. Although that was a while ago now. That was that was in 2009. Uh, but it's it's the leads. It's the lead story in uh, Unseeming, which okay. is uh, which which is my most successful book to date. And, you know, not. It's not a bestseller, but it's my best-selling title. Right. <laughs> yeah, even compared to, uh, even even compared to uh, the 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 books that I have published by other people uh, through Mythic Delirium Books, it has still uh, it has still sold the most copies. Although one of the books I published by uh, Theodora Goss is is going. To catch it like it's, it's yeah. like it's coming <laughs> I, I saw but, that she was one of the people that you worked with i was like oh okay <laughs> yeah this is so, so uh, say just just tossing i haven't i guess there'll be opportunity for this but this is the most recent book mm-hmm. I, I put out by her the collected enchantments yeah which is kind of it's a career overview of her fiction and and poetry that's connected to folklore uh and fairy tales and i've i'm i'm very i'm very honored that she's allowed us to be the the publisher who who brought this out uh and you know as, as you can see it's it's a brick oh, <laughs> it's, yeah yeah <laughs> it's, there's there's a lot of stuff in there but okay so so sorry i do that i i, I run know. off on on i run off on tangents i drive my friends crazy um so the the button bin uh, is an, is the first time I really kind of I learned a very kind of humbling lesson about how writing can work. Uh, the the inspiration for the story happened when uh, Anita and I were visiting uh, a a craft store, a fabric and craft store that uh that that uh is is a is a county i live in i live in rural virginia kind of the the southwest end and uh we were we were visiting a craft store in floyd and anita was shopping for fabric obviously and i was kind of there and and so i I uh, I just found somewhere to I just found somewhere to sit and and the the and where I was waiting, alas, this uh, this artifact does not exist anymore. It makes me sad. But uh, at the time, the this craft store had a button bin, and what it was was an RC cola machine. <laughs> <laughs> that had been that had been set on its face okay. with like the the guts taken out <laughs> and, and so this chassis of of this rc cola machine was like full almost to the top with buttons wow and so i started you know i started you know kind of just idly running my arm through the buttons and i i could i could stick my arm in like almost up to here and, you know, and then so I had this idea. Okay, what if, what if I pulled my arm out, and the buttons were sticking to my arm? Oh my goodness! And then what if I was unable to start unbuttoning my arm? And uh, <laughs> when when I when I had that thought, 
this this entire story like just exploded into my head <laughs> and, you know i've i've never had i've had similar experiences but i've never had anything quite that vivid happen to me b b before or since and like you know based i mean i'm not kidding like the entire plot like all of it just like boom wow and uh and then, you know, if you read this story, you'll be like, that's what popped into his head. Oh, my God. But because it's pretty dark. <laughs> but uh, so but then I was like, oh, man, I know this is a terrific idea. And I kept trying to write it. And each time I'd get I'd only get like a little pair. I get I'd only get like a few paragraphs in and then I'd be like, this isn't it. Yeah. Like, this is not this is not matching the power of what is in my head. And it actually took, it, it, it actually took several years for me to, to find the pieces that I needed that actually allowed me to, to deliver the idea at, at the, at, at, at the level of competence and intensity that I knew it needed, right. uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know, it, it, and, you know, it did, I mean, you know, it got on the, when it finally came out, it got on the nebula ballot and that's the only story of mine that ever did that. So clearly, you know, some instinct of mine was right. The, the, yeah. That was basically telling I'm, I don't have the skill to write this yet. <laughs> and, you know, it, and it took a few years for me. It took a few years for me to get to that point. Uh, you know, so. Uh, and I, I guess I'll toss out there the, the 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 two pieces that it turned out I needed. Uh, the two pieces that it turned out I needed. One was just. One, one was just I needed. I needed a plot device that helped me get from a certain point A to a certain point B that I had not that hadn't occurred to me in that original burst of inspiration. I finally did get it. And but I also needed to kind of get exposed to enough different writing styles to uh to to figure out what writing style was going to work for it. Uh and 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 uh if you if you read the button bin you'll <laughs> some people have objected to this when they've read it but i i stand by the decision it's written in second person oh man <laughs> so it's so it's you it's so it's so it's you did this you did that yeah you know and that turned out to be what worked okay. <laughs> and, but you know that didn't occur to me when i was first trying to do this yeah, I, I I can relate that when it comes to second person, it like it, like you said, there are some stories that it just you can't imagine it being told any other way that it works so right. well. But then sometimes reading second person is really hard. <laughs> that whole thing. <laughs> so so I can be you know that's kind of again sort of an extreme example. Uh, so my my typical writing process uh often involves uh often involves kind of either an idea striking me or these days it can even be like hmm there's this market i want to try and write something for it yeah. you know and and uh i write a, a lot of what i do uh in terms of preliminary writing or outlining when i when i use an outline or whatever uh i write in a steno pad you know, I, I don't, uh, and you know, sometimes, sometimes I'll hand write an entire draft. Uh, you know, sometimes it'll just be notes, but, you know, actually like using a pen and paper is, is always a part of my process. Wow. So you're way. an analog writer. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, and then, you know, I guess depending on how fast I need to crank it out, will kind of determine how quickly I bring the word processor in. <laughs> um, that's cool. I mean, I, again, that's another um, 
question that I some it wasn't on the list for today, but since you mentioned it, um, I do sometimes get into it with you know writers about you know are you analog, are you digital, or are you a combination of both? And it still amazes me how many people write analog. I I I I do analog in terms of like um, notes or like timelines or things like that. But when it comes to like actually writing out the story, I'm fully digital. And I thought for the longest time that there was a generational thing where only young people did things digitally, but it's not true. I, I've met writers of all ages and it doesn't matter. Some people sure. just prefer to handwrite and some people rely on technology. And as long as it works for you, it doesn't matter. Well, you know, you read about uh, authors like uh, the late Peter Straub. Or uh, Neil Neil Gaiman, who will talk about, oh, I hand wrote this entire novel longhand. <laughs> I've not quite attempted that. <laughs> yeah. That's too you much. Know, but, yeah, yeah. But I just that, feel that, the right is coming on. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but so, but you know, I have the the novels that I have written. I have I have a few that I have at least complete drafts of that have not appeared. And anywhere you know there's there's even some handwriting in, in, involved in that and i and i guess the the other sort of main element to what i do that may or may not be novel is is that no you know pun intended maybe <laughs> is, is is that uh i often take inspiration from dreams that i have i i feel like that's where a lot of my better ideas come from um I guess when I'm, you know, fully conscious, I'm I'm a little too subjective. But when I go to sleep, it's like anything goes. And so I'm more likely to come up with an idea that way. Right, right. Okay, well, that's really cool. Um, so we gotten to know a little bit about your process of, you know, how ideas come to you. I, I've never had a, a such a like visceral experience like the button bin, but I'm hoping I'll get something like that cross, one. Day. Cross fingers for you, yes. <laughs> So I want to move into the next segment It's called a book signing this is where we actually talk about some of your work, which you've already done, but I do want to um, ask you a very few specific questions. Sure. So this one is where I'm going to start out um, in your role as an editor and publisher. I want to know a little bit about um, Mythic Delirium. How I know you mentioned that it kind of started out as a zine, but like, where did the name come from and what does Mythic, um, Mythic Delirium kind of focus on now? Sure. Okay. So, uh, the idea for Mythic Delirium actually began while I was still an undergraduate at Virginia Tech. Uh, at least that's where I came up with the name. Okay. And uh, I don't think I was thinking about it any more deeply than you know what would what do I think would be a cool name for a magazine, and. The in hindsight, I I think the the because my tastes have been kind of consistent in this regard. I think the appeal, I think the appeal of the name for me is in part there's not a contradiction necessarily, but but a, a tension between the two words. You you have mythic with you know all that. All that that can entail, you know, from mythology to kind of, you know, larger than life adventure, you know, and then you have, you know, d delirium, you know, hallucinations, you know, d d d delusion, you know, surreal experiences, uh, e et cetera. And, you know, put put those two words together and, and what do you get? And I guess that's kind of what I've been exploring. Okay. Um, so... Uh, the the origins of Mythic Delirium as an actual publication that existed, I'll, I'll try to be succinct. They they were kind of pedestrian in a way. Uh, I I had never planned really when I was younger to become an editor or a, a publisher, but you know events conspired right. in some cases literally. So that in, in 1995, I actually self-published an anthology of, of work uh, collecting uh, stories and poems from other writers kind of based here in, in Southwest Virginia, 
uh, like the late Nelson Bond, uh, the late Bud Webster, I miss him so much, uh, you know, uh, Paul Dillinger, who's still, you know, very much with us, uh, the late uh, R.H.W. Dillard, uh, and, and uh, from there, I became involved in, from the, there, I became involved in other publishing projects, you know, I guess once, once that, once that cat was yeah. out of the bag, it, it couldn't be put back in. And uh, my, the initial projects I was involved in involved, you know, were kind of these sprawling collaborative things and, and uh and I I got to a point where I wanted to just do something solo. And so that was when I was like, okay, I had this idea way back when for this for this uh magazine, uh Mythic Delirium. You know, this was this was in 1998 when you were still kind of you you know, you had the desktop publishing boom, you know, happening, zines were, you know. Uh, you know, zines were still a really big thing, like little, like, you know, little, you know, little things that you sent in the mail to people. And so Mythic Delirium was initially just a, a poetry zine okay. that I would publish twice a year. And uh, the I put out the first two issues. Uh, I I think maybe, you know, uh, <laughs> not very many people saw them <laughs> and not, not, not very many people saw them. And, you know, the review venues I sent them to the, re the reception was sort of mixed and, uh, I got invited, uh, to join the team of a larger publishing house based in here in Southwest Virginia, uh, DNA publications. Okay. And uh, so, so I decided, okay, well, I'm maybe maybe I'm going to do that, and you know, I'm not going to worry about Mythic Delirium because it doesn't seem to be catching on. Uh, and uh, Ellen Datlow at the time was co-editing the Year's Best Fantasy and Horror with Terry Windling. Uh, you know, those volumes, alas, are not are, are not being published anymore. Uh, you know, Ellen's now doing the, the best horror of the year uh, with Nightshade Books. But at this time, you know, that was, you know, they were they were they were collaborating on those books. And when the next volume of that came out, I had sent a cop. I had sent copies of Mythic Delirium to, to Ellen and to Terry and Ellen listed my first issue in her kind of summary of the year as as one of the best things that she had read oh, you know i mean cool. among many other things that she'd read that she liked but but you know she really she said some very nice things about it and warren lapine uh the publisher of dna read that and it was like hey why don't you do this zine for me <laughs> and so and you know to 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 contract the story, suddenly Mythic Delirium was alive again, oh. and and it was it was part of it was part of this company that was also publishing Weird Tales, and uh, some of some of the 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 bigger semi pro science fiction magazines of that time, Aboriginal Science Fiction, Absolute Magnitude, uh, and and so for about five years. Uh, so, so, so about five years, Mythic Delirium was part of this, you know, company that was actually getting newsstand distribution. Now, Mythic Delirium did never, never appeared on a newsstand, but ads for it did. So it got a ton of subscribers compared to what I've been able to do on my own. Not a lot, but, you know, uh, every, everything has to be kind of relative here. But so, so, um, so, wow, I'm getting into way detail about this. So, so, um, so circumstances conspired after about five years that it began to look like uh, things would work better if I actually was running it myself, okay. in, in instead of it being part of DNA. And Warren gave his blessing to do that, and so I was able to set out on my own, take my subscribers with me. 
uh, and uh, and you know, and the zine continued for many more years like that. And in the meantime, I began uh, to gradually experiment with you know editing books, and I had uh, through another uh, kind of through through another kind of semi pro publisher, Noralana Books. I edited a series of books called Clockwork Phoenix. Uh, there, and you you notice once again, there's that kind of weird juxtaposition in the name, you know, Mythic Delirium, Clockwork Phoenix. And those books, uh, the Clockwork Phoenix anthologies got a lot of acclaim. Uh, and I and I ended up, you know, there were stories from those books that were nominated for awards and et cetera. And the same thing had been happening kind of with the the poetry in Mythic Delirium. And once again, circumstances kind of conspired where, you know, it looked like I realized if I wanted to continue Clockwork Phoenix, I would need to do it myself as opposed through opposed to doing it through a, 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 another publisher. And I held a Kickstarter uh to to fund the fourth volume and it was it was a success awesome and 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 so and you know norlana books you know gave you know vera nazarian with norlana books gave her blessing for me to kind of set out on my own just like what had happened at mythic delirium and so by 2012 i've now got all of this stuff kind of under one umbrella and you know and and uh that that is when th that is when mythic delirium books okay becomes a thing okay cool all right so we are um kind of getting to the end of this um interview i've had so much fun but now it's time to kind of switch gears a little bit and get silly all right this is the segment i call don't judge a book by its cover because i ask just kind of off the wall questions and we just see what kind of answers we get. I'll see what I can do. All right. So the first scenario that I have set up is a never have I ever situation. <laughs> so um, if if you agree that you haven't done it, you will say, yep, I, I have never done that or I have done it and just kind of tell me, you know, why. Sure. So the first scenario is <clears throat> never have I ever pretended or faked reading a classic or a popular book just to fit in with other people i've done it for class <laughs> <laughs> i i've oh. done it before too not i don't haven't done it a lot but i do remember one specific situation where everybody's like oh haven't you read such and such and i was like yeah sure i have <laughs> so so what i tend to do in that sort of situation uh what is you know i don't say that i've read it i'm just sort of like mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know and then you know if i end up getting asked directly i'm i'm like oh no no i haven't actually read it but i've read about it or or something like that <laughs> i think i think in my situation i was like oh you know what i end up um dnf in it i couldn't finish it so I couldn't answer any questions. Sure, but, sure. That's a good that's a good answer. Like I, I started it. It just, you know, I didn't finish it. <laughs> so, you know, I've I've been I you know, I suppose I've been on panels where I've I've been on panels where I really wasn't at all an expert on the topic. I don't know that I can immediately think of like a book. Uh you know, where but what so so before Right now I work, my actual day job right now is as I work at Virginia Tech in media relations, okay. but, but for 25 years, I was a newspaper reporter oh. and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, at the very end, an editorial writer. And so my, my, my weapon of choice when I, when I'm in that situation is to kind of fall back on my journalistic instincts. And so instead of like making my own comment on something, I'll be like, well, I'd like to know from you, you know, 
what what did you think was most important about this book <laughs> or, uh, that that kind of thing yeah, let's just a little bit. <laughs> i like that all right so the next question that i have um <clears throat> And I'm actually really excited about this question because I think it kind of fits with the dark theme of your writing. And this okay. is just totally me being a geek girl. If you don't know, um, I am totally into like comic books and superheroes and all that kind of stuff. So sure. if you were going to be a villain, what would be your villain power and your like, your your beef with like the world? <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. And you'd think I'd have a ready answer for this because I, you know, because I've had, <laughs> I've, I've created so many villains in, in the course of my, my little career. Uh, what power would I want as a villain? Um, so what, you, maybe this is influenced by, maybe this is influenced by, by recent politics, but, you know, uh, I, I I have this I have this idea bubbling in my head that I would I would love to be I would I would love to be able to point at certain in 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 individuals and say you will never be able to speak again <laughs> <laughs> you know not you won't even be able to write no words will ever be able to emerge from you again though I think the way I'm thinking of deploying that that would actually make me a superhero so maybe it's not. <laughs> a great answer <laughs> you know it could, that could be one of those powers that could go either way like maybe it's the power that you have and you use it for good but if someone were to get it they could use it for bad oh it could absolutely be used for evil and maybe i would use it for evil if i got you know on a power trip or, yeah. or which 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 could certainly which could certainly happen i don't so so the 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 monsters that i tend to come up with in in my stories uh you know often have this this isn't really original to me i th i think it's just it's just a kind of villain that that i find uh, a, attractive in in however it appears whether it's like you know hp lovecraft or 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 laird baron if you haven't read any stories by laird baron he's he's amazing oh. uh or you know this i this idea of you know the, this 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 idea of of the monster that is like you know that, that that is like you know you know just just surrender completely to me and let me have your soul and your body and all of your problems are are over and you you know <laughs> and, um i i I resort to that. I resort to that kind of villain, gotcha. you know, a, a lot. Uh, and and you know, even the story, the story, the button bin, even even has some of that going on. Although although the catch is usually, you know, the 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 catch is usually is like, you know, once once you've given yourself to once you've given yourself to the evil, what actually what actually happens to you is something worse than death. Like, right. you know, it's horror beyond what you could have conceived, you know? So, you know, the, the, so, you know, the villain was of course, you know, lying about, imagine that about being the, the benevolent, <laughs> you know, the, the benevolent grantor of wishes. Uh, yeah, I have this one character again, I created him more than like, 10 years ago and I'm kind of reworking him now but he's that kind of villain he, but he he doesn't promise to like get rid of people's like like he basically presents himself as this villain but he says that he can give you like power right and right people are willing to just you know sell their soul sell their life whatever it is to get that power and then you find out yeah you have the power but you have no control over it he still controls the power right so right that's cool. like ultimate evil <laughs> No, that sounds really cool. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm re, I'm tweaking him a little bit. So, like I said, I made him like 15 years ago. So, he's gonna see the light of day again. Okay. Okay. 
So um, we've kind of come to the conclusion. Um, thank you so much for spending time with me today, especially since I know you just recovered from surgery. So I had a really good time. Um, I'm so excited that, you know, to look forward to some of the work that you've kind of presented here today. Well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. This, is, this has been an honor and a delight. I'm glad. So before we do cut off, why don't you just let the viewers know where they can find you and your work online? All right. So the easiest place to find me is at mythicdelirium.com. Uh, that is obviously that's the website for, for Mythic Delirium. But a lot of my own books, uh, as, as, as part of that long process that I've told you about, they would be published by someone else and then I would get the rights to them. And so the books that I've talked about, like The Black Fire Concerto or Unseeming, are also now under the Mythic Delirium label. So that's where you can find my writing, as well as the writing of, of the authors I choose to publish, and also uh, the archives of the Mythic Delirium magazine. Uh, the, the, digital, the digital phase of that magazine, all the content of that is still uh, free to be found on that site, as well as a number of sample stories and chapters from, from our books. Uh, I, do have, uh, I do have a site of my own, uh, uh, Descent Into Light, dot com it's it's that is a line from one of my older poems i used to write much much more poetry now i'm more focused on short stories but you can find a you know and that has that has some of my uh i've never been somebody who like you know overshares online so my blog's kind of boring but that's where my blog is is that you know uh at, at descentintolight.com but you can find a link to that at mythicdelirium.com um and so on twitter i'm also mythic delirium you may notice a pattern <laughs> and uh on blue sky which i just joined i am mythic delirium and on instagram i'm mythic delirium uh and on on facebook i am time shark <laughs> 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 so uh but like link links to those uh links to those at least to some of those social media things you can find off of either i one of my one of my two websites and uh so i have um i have a couple of upcoming appearances planned and hopefully i will be able to walk <laughs> by, by by the time these dates come around but uh, in in the uh, first weekend of November uh, in Richmond, uh, the Libby's Place Barnes and Noble is holding uh, the second annual Halloween Hangover event, wow. which is which is which is a, a really cool thing that they started doing last year and that I managed to kind of weasel my way into getting myself invited to uh, in in which it's 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 called Halloween Hangover because it's after Halloween. And they invite they 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 bring in horror writers and horror publishers from all over the the region, you know, not just not just in Virginia, but from Maryland and and, and DC and et cetera. And uh, we all get together in that store and sign books and talk to customers and have panels and and it's a lot of fun and, and i'm oh going to be <laughs> yeah 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 and i'm I'm going to be doing that uh and uh haven't cemented this in in stone yet but hopefully if 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 folks don't know about this event they should um there's there's a group uh that the, the there's there's a group based in atlanta that that hold an event called the outer dark symposium and this is you know not unlike what i just described with halloween hangover it's a gathering not just for horror writers but for people who write kind of you know offbeat out there dark so, sort of fiction and it it was put on pause uh it, it was put on pause because of covid like everything else Else. <laughs> but, but it's you know the, the 
they're they're coming back as an in-person event in the coming spring and and, and anita and i ab absolutely plan to attend that and i don't know if this is going to be uh i don't know if this is going to be how they do it this time around but i'm hoping so uh but you know it's definitely one of the perks when they last held the event which i guess would have been the last in-person event was in 2019 you know, Atlanta is kind of like almost, uh, you know, there are a lot of films that that get developed there. And so there's there's a there's a film there's a film industry aspect to, you know, the 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 economic development and the, the culture uh, in that, you know, in, in that city. And the last Outer Dark was held uh, at a special effects shop, Silver Scream. And that was just like amazing. Yep. <laughs> and and you know, I, I believe the plan is for them to do that again, which is just, you know, you, you don't if you're able to go, you don't want to miss it. It's terrific. Yeah. yeah. So um I think that sums up how to find me. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that, especially um the upcoming events as well. So for the rest of you, be sure to stick around for the credits because I always have something fun there. And um, Mike does have something special for my Patreon supporter. So be on the lookout for that. And until next time, guys, stay safe, be blessed, and have fun reading. Bye-bye. Hey, viewers, don't go anywhere. Mike Allen has a lot of extra fun stuff to share with you from this interview. So be sure to click the video above to see our bonus video.